Hello there everyone and welcome to this short reflection coming from Killin Parish Mans. As always the candle is lit behind me so let's begin with our great affirmations. The light of the world has come. Jesus is the light of the world. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness will never overcome it. Amen. Well, how are you getting on reading through Mark's Gospel, those of you who have taken up the challenge to do so? I'm assuming that many of you are having questions and perhaps even difficulties in reading it if you are coming to the Bible, certainly for the first time. In Mark's Gospel, you would very quickly have come across incidents where there are miracles and even exorcisms. And that might have raised some issues for you. So let's have a wee think about this issue. There are miracles in the Bible, but they're not all the way through the Bible uniformly. They're clustered around two people. Firstly, Moses, and then secondly, Jesus. Now, there are periodically uh, miraculous events that take place outside of that but by and large it's the establishment of the first covenant through Moses with the people of Israel and then the establishment of the new covenant covenant with uh, God's people through the ministry of Jesus. So the Bible's not full of miracles, they're not sprinkled all randomly over the place, they're very specific in the way they enter the narrative and they appear to us as we read the Bible. First point I would make is this. If God exists, then miracles are possible because what we call miracles to God are, are no big thing. So if God exists, miracles are possible. That's the first point. Second point is miracles are of limited use. And that's obvious in the ministry of Jesus. They raise questions, they raise questions then, and indeed they raise, raise questions for us now. But it's very clear that they can become a distraction. In the ancient world, there was a lot of question marks about people who performed magic, who performed miracles. Not everyone was convinced. They were controversial, controversial then, they're controversial now. But what is clear from the ministry of Jesus is there's a larger perspective. God, in a sense, is not a genie. So it's not all about the miracles. It's very clear in Mark's Gospel that Jesus is much more than a wonder worker. And this is where we come to the, the, the general framework of Mark. The first eight chapters, we have Jesus doing many things. A man of action, Mark's Gospel, moves along at an incredible pace, as I mentioned last week. But from chapter 8 onwards, there's the movement towards the, the finale of the gospel, and that's Jesus in Jerusalem. And Jesus wasn't a wonder worker who went through Galilee, then he goes to Jerusalem, and he does wonders there as well. He sorts out the religious authorities, he sorts out the Romans in a miraculous way. No, there's a real change, but we'll come to that in the next few weeks as we approach Easter. The point I'm trying to make is for Mark and for all the gospel writers, there's a general framework of the revelation of God in and through Jesus Christ, and it culminates in Easter. And we've got to remember that. So Jesus had a mission, and that mission we see as the suffering servant, the suffering Messiah, which is a contradiction in terms from the first chapters of Mark where obviously as the Christ, he's performing acts that you would associate with Jesus being the Christ. So as we saw last week, when Mark declares that this is the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, we wait, okay, so who is the Son of God? We expect something to take place and we're not disappointed. We see in the miracles of Jesus alongside his exorcisms and of course his teaching something of a revelation of who the Christ is. But if we stop at the wonder working, we've missed the point. They can be a distraction. So as well as being part and parcel of the credentials of Jesus, they also can raise more questions 
than they actually answer. What about exorcisms? Well, I would say this to you. Do you believe that there is evil in the world? When we look at human history, do you think there is evil? Or do you just think occasionally there are bad things? Just like there are good things? Or is there a reality called evil? Is that evil demonic? Speaking personally, although I, as a rationalist as well, have lots of problems with issues of miracles and, and exorcisms and that whole idea of the demonic, my reflection on history and human experience is such that I cannot not believe there is a demonic element behind all things. And what we have in the ministry of Jesus is he's like a magnet. As the Christ is revealed, the magnet draws the evil out. He's like a poultice, to use another metaphor or illustration, that draws out the evil. Now, note that we start every Sunday with the great affirmations. The light of the world has come. Yeah, We believe that Jesus is the Messiah. He's the Christ. That's what Mark is telling us. The light shines in the darkness. Is there dark darkness? You bet there is. Is that darkness sometimes demonic? I believe it is. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness will never overcome it. And what we have in the drama of Mark's gospel is the attempt to overcome the light of God revealed in Jesus Christ. But a further point. The incidents that Mark highlights as miracles of healing or uh, exorcisms are also parables. It's very clear from the way the gospel writers, including Mark, use the miracle stories that there's a message there. There's a, a theological message that they're, they're trying to get across to us that goes beyond just the incident itself. So let's look at one of these. And it's in Mark's gospel and it's chapter 2. And it's the healing of the paraplegic. A few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. So many gathered that there was no room left, not even outside the door. And he preached the word to them. Some men came bringing to him a paraplegic carried by four of them. Since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus and after digging through it, lowered the mat the paralysed man was lying on. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paraplegic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now some teachers of the law were sitting there, thinking to themselves, Why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately Jesus knew in his spirit that this was what they were thinking in their hearts. And he said to them, Why are you thinking these things? Which is easier to say to the paraplegic, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Get up, take your mat, and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. He got up, took his mat and walked out in full view of them all. This amazed everyone. And they praised God, saying, We have never seen anything like this. Amen. Let's think for a few moments about that story. Firstly, they were amazed they had never seen anything quite like this. It was well known at the time of Jesus there were healers, there were those who performed magic rites. Um, but in all these things, there was an awful lot of paraphernalia. Uh, they required the people who needed help or needed the healing uh, to take a part in various rituals. There were incantations and formulas that they had to recite, sometimes for days, sometimes for weeks. And there was a lot of mumbo jumbo around it. Along comes Jesus and everything he seems to do is like that. And it's like, wow, this is not the usual magician we are used to. This is not the usual healer. There's something different about him. But let's get back to this story. 
In the time of Jesus, there was a strong connection between sin and suffering. And often people felt that if they were suffering, they must have done something wrong. And of course, in ancient times when you had many gods, sometimes the gods were seen to be angry. And that's true of polytheism throughout history. You have lots of angry gods that need to be placated. And then that got transferred to the notion of the one God. Perhaps the one God of all is angry with us. And I think if we interpret this story here in Mark in the larger context of what Jesus stood for, his compassion, his kindness, what he revealed about God. And remember the prodigal son, his greatest parable. The father wasn't angry with his son. Remember, in the, the tradition of the day, the son, the son should have been disowned. So the father said, I don't have a son. He's lost forever. But it's clear from the story that the father is looking out on that road, waiting and longing for his son to return. And when he does, he runs down the road to embrace him, which would have raised eyebrows in the crowds when Jesus told this parable. Because that would have no dignity. The father wouldn't have had any dignity. The son was wrong. He should have been punished. And Jesus, that parable so highlights what Jesus was about. And the way I interpret this story, the man himself might well have thought that God was angry with him and he was being punished because of his sin. And Jesus cuts right through that. He includes forgiveness along with healing as part and parcel of the same package. And you can almost hear the compassion through the words that Mark uses. It's like Jesus is saying through his whole ministry is, God says this to you, I am not angry with you, my child. I love you. Come home. Do not be afraid. This Easter, or at least the countdown to Easter, where are we? Are we on the periphery of the faith? Have we lost our way? Do our hearts need to be warmed again? Do we need to come home? Or perhaps you've recently got interested in things to do with the faith, perhaps through this online service. But you're out there somewhere. You've never quite journeyed to the centre. We'll continue the journey. And over these next weeks, on the build-up to Easter, travel home. Our Lord is waiting for us. He says, do not be afraid. I love you. Jesus reveals that above all other things. And I hope we hear that message in these sometimes crazy stories or weird stories that Mark tells about the dynamic Christ who revealed so much then and reveals it now. Let's pray. Lord, Touch our hearts through the words of Mark's gospel. There may well be things we don't quite understand, things that puzzle us, things we find hard to believe. But through your spirit, help us to come alive to this Christ, Jesus, your son, the one who taught with authority, who loved with an eternal heart, and who, yes, healed, healed and also exercised the demons. May we be healed internally and externally on this journey of faith. Draw us ever closer to you. In his name we pray. Amen. My friends, thank you for watching and listening. May God be with you this coming week. Amen.